All right, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Autodesk Virtual Academy. I'm Nigel Mbayek, uh, one of the customer success managers here at Kativ. And uh, today I'm joined by a couple people, but first and foremost uh, is one of my colleagues here, Jeff Perez. Jeff, how's it going? How you doing? Good morning, Nigel. Doing great. Awesome. So today we're going to be going over uh, tube and pipe, uh, specifically in Autodesk Inventor. And Jeff's going to be going over some uh, isometric, draw isometric drawing creation something Jeff's been really familiar with as he's one of the instructors we have on our team for tube and pipe as well as things like plant 3D. So I'm really excited that Jeff's uh, here to join us and teach this session. If anyone has any questions at any time, go ahead and post those into your respective chat panels. We'll go ahead and answer any of those during the session or during the dedicated Q&A at the end. Um, and if anyone has anything else, you can go ahead and type those in and we'll answer those even if they're not related to today's session. Um, but with that, I guess I'll pass it over um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So for today, we're going to be going and discussing, this is going to be a direct continuation from the previous AVA that I went through a couple of months ago. I did kind of run out of time in, in that where I was talking about advanced tube and pipe workflows. I was specifically trying to add in drawings in there. I, I missed it a little bit. So we're going to be tackling that today. We did get a qu quite a bit of questionings for how to create these drawings after we have established our routes and runs inside of t Inventor itself. Um, so we'll be, this is going to be a direct continuation off that. So if you did not see that previous one, I would definitely recommend taking a look at our Autodesk Virtual Academy playlist on our YouTube page and uh, get up to date with that video. So if you don't know me, myself, I'm Jeff Perez. I'm a customer success manager here at Katif Technologies. I recently just moved into this role. I previously worked with many of you on the lifeline support aspect. So you may have, I may have worked with you within our, our ticket and case management um, solution there. Um, my background inside of, of well, in, my background itself is inside of the oil and gas industry, where I use a lot of tools from the product design manufacturing collection, such as Plant 3D and Venter and Vault. And then I ended up uh, moving industries into more of an architectural AAC firm where I leverage additional tools under the AAC collection for Autodesk products, such as Revit, Navisworks, and BIM 360. So I do have a, quite a bit of understanding of how these different products and services all kind of communicate together, all right? Now for today, our objectives are going to be structuring our tube and pipe models. I'll then be providing some strategies for creating your inventor isometric drawings. And then lastly, I will be talking about how you can gain an efficiency bump, um, leveraging your designs into Plant 3D, okay? So many of you may, be familiar with Plan 3D, maybe many of you may not. Um, you probably, if you do have a product design manufacturing collection, you either you'll have Plan 3D accessible to your needs, as well as even AutoCAD specialized tool sets. So if you do just have any of those licensing, you do have Plan 3D. So I'll show you how you can how you can leverage some of your designs into that environment as well. So with that being said, we'll just dive right into it from the demo portion. We'll go from this demo and we'll go directly into Inventor. So if you were a part of the last ABA, you, you did see we were working with this, um, this little compressor skid package that I built up. Um, you could kind of see we do have some unique equipment in here. We have some compressors. Uh, we have some heat exchangers in here. And then we do have some several tube and pipe routes that have been generated inside of this assembly itself. Now, in terms of overall assembly structure, I touched on this a little bit in the last session. Um, but for today, I really want to talk about our tube and pipe runs themselves and structuring these runs so that you could quickly identify what runs are associated with. Maybe you're generating these from a uh, process and instrumentation diagram, otherwise known as a PNID document. So typically, a process and instrumentation diagram will be typically di dictating what your routes and runs are going to be generated of, what, what type of scheduling is going to be needed for your piping and your fittings. Um, so giving an understanding of what runs and routes are associated to those PNID documents via the labeling of the route will help you identify what particular process that is. And what I mean by that is if you go into your tools and go into your application options here, 
and then go into the file tab. And then under file naming defaults here, there is this tube and pipe file naming default segment here. Now, if you before I kind of touch on this particular aspect here, you could kind of see that on my tree on this left hand side here, I do have several routes. So about 20 isometric routes right here, uh, where the very first routes from one to 11 are utilizing a, a just a random generated naming scheme here. You can kind of see that it has pipe run 001. And you can see the reflection of that within here. So this is where that that naming scheme is directly being comprised from. So it's my pipe run. It's bringing in this index number of 01. I find that it becomes very important for you to establish and understand how you want to label your routes, whether you want to label these by this particular naming scheme, or maybe you have your own company standard and want to follow that and match it to what is visually shown on your PNID document. You can, and you could change that configuration directly here, as well as seeing that inside of your tree here. Okay. So if I were to use just this regular isometric naming scheme here, I would probably never understand what's, where this has a relationship to my PNID document. Versus coming down here, I see that I, I've changed my labeling here from one, 112 to 113 to 114. And this is gonna help me understand that this ISO 1112 was being driven from my PNID document, okay? So I'm gonna close out of this really quick. And then what I'll do here is, now that I have understood this labeling, this labeling and how I've dictated all this information here, so I'm just kind of scanning through these ISOs here. When I want to, now begin creating an isometric drawing and i'm going to change my iso view here i'll go with this oil header here that i have right there and i'm going to double click into this route i would also recommend that you get in you get in contact with your shop or your fabricator or whoever's going to be generating these isometrics and understand what their current process and philosophy philosophies are and what is visually needed from the isometric drawings that you're going to be submitting to the fabricator Okay, so on top of that, fabrication shops reference dimensions various, you know, differently across your shops and your fabricators. They're all, they reference these dimensions quite differently, whether it's from a face of a flange or a, a center of a fitting. Okay, so with this, with that being said, work with your shop, understand what their needs are for the drawing so that when you create this drawing and we translate these designs into the drawing, you're capturing all the needs that they need for that. Now, there's a couple of different ways for us to create these drawings. So we have this pipe run zero two here. Now I could create a drawing by directly opening this pipe run and I'm gonna click open there and it's gonna open this isometric run here. Now I can go into new now and then create a new standard IDW, or if you have any isometric standards, you can. And I, in this case I do, I have an is, a standard isometric template. So I'm gonna open that. And you could kind of see that because I've, I've worked closely with my shop, I understand that the shop requires uh, quantity information. I, I see that I have a quantity note here, maybe even particular well details you could have in there, even welding notes. Establishing this upfront within a template is only gonna help you um, be a little bit more efficient with creating these drawings. Okay. So now that I have this drawing open, and this is just a unique isometric template that I've created for my drawings, I can then go and go into my base view here. And because I have that route open here, you can see that this pipe run 002 is open. It's automatically recognizing that I have this model that I can place in here. So I could adjust this model, place it where I need to. And in this case, because this, this doesn't have any unique change of directions, it's just a straight run with fittings welded. We have some weld lit and flanges butted together. And then we have a, a flange with a, a, um, a, a blind flange at the end right there. I'm happy with this. I'm just gonna place this and click okay. Or I could place my isometric view, which is what I probably wanna do in this case here. 
and I'll start establishing what my drawing is going to look like. And again, the overall workflow for creating an, a drawing or an isometric drawing from your tube and pipe runs isn't going to change from how you're creating drawings currently inside of Inventor. It's just understanding where you can pull these particular assemblies from. Okay, so you saw that in this assembly, I found the ISO that I wanted, I wanted to create. I went into this, my tube and pipe runs assemblies itself, found the run and opened it. Another way you can do that, another way you can create these and locate these drawings is if you go into open, and if you go back a folder, I'll go into, or if I go back a folder, I'm gonna go into where my ISOs are actually being saved at. And it's under my skid package assembly. And you should have an AIP folder that gets created when you're generating your tube and pipe runs. Inside this AIP folder, you'll get an additional folder for tube and pipe. But within here, I'll see all the sub routes that have been created. So routes my 112 to my 120, which I see down below here. I see my runs 01 to run 12, which are these right here. I could dig into one of these folders and I'll say, I'll just go with route two here. And then I could find a sub assembly there. And there's that same sub assembly that I opened. So you can open it up this way. And then, and, I'll, and let me go back a folder really quick. Let me go to my run zero one here and I'll open up this one just cause I don't wanna open up the same run here. And I can open it up this way. And it's really the same exact way as opening it up directly from your assembly and then creating your drawing. So I'll create my, IDW. I could then place my base. I could place my top, my isometric, and then click OK. Now for setting up your drawings, I've found myself finding it a little bit easier to place my views. And then once I have my views here, with the understanding of what your shop needs, I know my shop and my fabricator typically references center lines for all fabrication. So I'm gonna populate all my center lines first and foremost. So I'll go through here, generate my center lines, my center marks, place these around, okay. I'm gonna add a center mark here just for this flange there, okay. And you could, and you could tell this is quite a, a pretty basic simplistic ISO drawing, this one, isn't going to take much time to create. And I'll just adjust this here. So now that I have these center marks here, I'll just align these and I'll I'll create a little point, just eyeballing it right there. Now I'll place a couple of dimensions here. Uh, again, this is where I would recommend working with your, your shop and understanding what's needed visually from the drawings that you're going to be submitting to fabrication. I know my shop really likes the overall length of the spool. So I'll provide that, that dimension. And again, whether your shop requires decimal dimensions versus maybe fractional. So you may have different standards. And then I'll do a dimension from the face of this flange to the center of this, this flange there. That way I understand where that's gonna be tacked and cut. In this case here, in this front view here, I'm gonna do another overall. So you can kind of see this is just a pretty basic isometric drawing. This one's not gonna to take too much time to create. I'm gonna put my overall length, my height. I'm gonna do a reference dimension here to the flange height. Because I know these are ASME fittings, um, there's probably not gonna to be too much difference is in terms of overall values here because this is a standard flange and this is a standard T. So this dimension is really just gonna be a reference for my shop. Okay, they're not gonna be able to control this. I'll just put a reference, something like that. Okay, so I begin to add my dimensions. That's probably all I'm gonna need for this. Um, you, again, you could add as many dimensions as you need if you need reference dimensions like this. I find myself not needing these or my shop may not need these. Um, just, you know, you're just adding ex excess information onto your drawings. Now what I'll do as well, now that I have this kind of laid out here, I'll go into my parts list now. And within my parts list, I'm going to structure and change my BOM view to a parts only. And I'll click OK and place that build material here in the upper right hand corner. Okay. 
Now, if I look at this bill material, I could kind of see what items are a part of this particular ISO run and route. So I do see that I have a couple of butt weld fittings. I see my, my carbon steel pipe here, um, some various gaskets, uh, flanges, and even um, any of my, my long radius components as well, which are my elbows. Now that I have this place here, you can go through here and change some of the format of this. So if you, whether you want to kind of sort these by a description or even item or maybe even part number, you can. And again, I would definitely work with what your shop may be needing from a parts list in, in terms of fabricating this particular design. Okay, so we've got my front view. I got my dimensions, right? A couple of things I would probably add here is just add some view callouts. So I'll, I'll give this a front view call out there. I'll enable this label here. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get rid of the scale. I don't need the scale in this. So I'll just get rid of that scale and click OK. And I'll just move this out. You kind of see that I'm just orientating this. I'm setting this up. I'm going to do the same thing for my top view. Label that. Turn on my light bulb. I'll edit my view label. And then I'm just going to get rid of the scale. Um, the scale is not going to be important for fabrication of this particular ISO. Okay. And then lastly, just go into this, this label here, call this isometric view, turn on the label, and then go into deleting the scale, clicking OK. okay. So you can see we've already got our overall dimensions. Um, so that portion of this ice is already done. With the last portion of this is really just bubbling this, ballooning this in relationship to the parts list. So I'm just going to go through and balloon a couple of these items here. I'll balloon my elbow, click continue. I'll balloon my flange. And then you're just going to end up ballooning all the items within this ISO. Okay. Do that here. Just go around. And I'm not making this particularly pretty. Um, you can kind of see some of these are little tweaks. So if you, again, uh, if you want this to look really pretty, I would take your time and try to get everything oriented as needed, right? So this overall ISO is pretty much almost complete, right? So the, the last couple of things that are gonna be required for this is cross-checking your parts list. Like it becomes very important to do so. Now, oftentimes what I found myself with parts list <laughs> and not visually, uh, looking into your design. I, I, I used to do design reviews within my ISO before creating the drawing itself, because what you may find is as you're creating this drawing and you start labeling things, an example of this could be this, set, this elbow here could be a different schedule than this elbow here. If this elbow was a different schedule, I'd have to go back into my assembly itself and change out that elbow and then go back into this drawing and update it. So you could kind of see that would take quite a bit of time to do. So if you're catching mistakes in your parts list here, you're gonna to have to go back into your design and switching out the component. And then go back in here and update it and make sure that your bubbles get repopulated properly. So what you can do beforehand, and this is what I'll recommend, and I'll do this with this header here. I believe I have the header open. Let me close this out really quick. I'll show you an example of this. Close out of this one. Close out of this one. Okay. So I'll go back into this header. So to reduce, to reduce and be a little bit more effective with your design and translating this into a drawing, go into your run or your route inside of Inventor, and then go into your ma manage tab. Uh, manage over here, and then go into the bill material beforehand. And you could do a parts list. I've already enabled this. Uh, what you may see that is the parts, your parts only is disabled, but I've already enabled my parts only here. What I would recommend is do a check inside of your parts list to make sure all your components are, are correct, making sure that these are in line with any pipe specification that you're following. Um, in this case, I could kind of see, as I'm kind of scheming through here, I see that my, my reducer is Schedule 80, so that's correct. This should be a Schedule 80 header. But then as I'm coming down here, I see that this pipe right here 
is schedule 40. It's the wrong schedule. My shop's not going to be able to weld these two components together because of the differences of the schedule and thickness between these components. So if I were, if I was going through already the process of creating this drawing, which you already saw and I closed it, I would have had to go back into, into the assembly and change it out. So I could go through here, change out the components I need. I could change size. I'll wait for this to come through and then change out your schedule. So I know that this was schedule 80. Maybe I wanna match my pipe schedule. So I'll just change this to 40. And then if I go back into my manage tab again, go back into my bill materials here, I could confirm that change has gone through, just cross checking all my components, making sure those are all the correct scheduling. All right, so this looks about right. I'm just gonna double check, make sure there's nothing else in here that looks like it is the incorrect schedule or maybe even the incorrect item. So my weld lets look like they're the correct scheduling. That looks all fine. Now within here, I can go through here and sort this particular run. So maybe I wanna sort this run by my description or maybe even by part number. You can sort it by your part number first. If you're leveraging unique part numbering, and then by my description. Okay. Now I could change my orientation of my description. Maybe you wanna um, do it ascending versus descending. I'll change that here. And I'll see that this changes. Now the last step here before I finish this is I'm just gonna renumber this. You can see that my item numbering is completely off and that's because I just changed my sorting. So it's going from four down to eight. I'm gonna change the numbering and renumber these to one and click okay. And now done. Now what I'll do is I'll just, now that I set this one up, I've gone through it. I, I did a little mini design review of this ISO making sure that it, everything matches my specification and, the, and its original design intent. I'll just back out and I'll save this. So I had a quick key, I just returned to home and I'm just gonna save this. Make sure that that change gets actually implemented into your design. So then you could go back into this run and open it and then place it back into a drawing. And I'll go base, place my view again. I could do that same isometric view here, change my view around. And then when I go and annotate and pick my parts list here and change my structure to parts only, and place that parts only view here and click okay, you're gonna see that this build material is gonna retain that sorting that I did beforehand. And then because I already went through my BOM beforehand, I know that all my components are correct. Okay, so in terms of my scheduling, the fittings I have in here. So everything looks fine. I like the way this is visually seen. I can then save this, finish annotating this and dimensioning this particular drawing. Now, other things I've ran into um, at my uh, some of the previous companies I've worked at is being effective with your overall design and being proficient with creating the drawings. And kind of what I mean by that is understanding when your routes should kind of be split up to remove complexity. Now, you could kind of see that I do have this route. Let me let me go into my assembly here. It lets me select there. I see that I have this route here, and this is my run 11 there. Um, it's it's not that complex, but there is quite a bit of, of parts and valves and, and drain fittings and even vent fittings in here. To generate this ISO would take quite a bit of time compared to what this isometric looks like, right? This is just a simple you know start and end point for a route, where this one, you have multiple tie-ins, we have multiple com uh, components and fittings in here. It's going to take quite a bit of time for me to dimension this, to create my spools, and then annotate it. All right. And I already kind of did this beforehand, so I'll show you this really quick. And I'll go into this drawing right here. Okay. So I, I, just to save some time, I already placed my views here. So I placed my front view, I placed my top view, my isometrics, and my right side view. Now I've placed some overall dimensions here. Okay, so these are these are all reference dimensions from 
the valves that I have, um, any little particular spool that I have here, um, dimensions going to my center line so that um, my shop can understand where they may need to flame cut a hole for a weld alit. This, this particular drawing right here has taken me about probably 10 minutes just to lay out place and dimension and then bring in my parts list, right? Now I haven't even got into creating the ballooning yet. So once I begin to start ballooning all this information here, you'll start to see that this starts becoming really overly populated. And the problem with having a super overly populated drawing like this is your shop will have a hard time visually understanding what you're looking to create or what is being given to them to fabricate. So you, you'll see, I'm just gonna put some annotations here, some more bubbles from my parts list here. I'm just gonna add a couple more here. Now, as, as I'm populating these balloons, you're probably wondering, man, this is gonna be, you're probably thinking this is gonna take some time to really check this drawing, right? Cross-checking this before you're submitting this to the shop. And I've, I've before when I was designing, I, I ended up going into more of like a QC within my company where I would check my team's drawings. Drawings like this did take quite a bit of time to check before approving. Right, because you have quite a bit of information that you want to make sure matched. Checking the parts list versus the balloon, making sure that it's the correct call out, making sure that you've captured every item from the parts list is another thing too. So as you're seeing here, I got this flange. Um, oops, I over, I reballooned that again. So I got this flange here, and I'm just going to add my gasket to this. I'll attach a gasket to this balloon list here. Uh, where is my gasket at? See if I could find my gasket on this list. And there it is. Here's my gasket. I'll just add this gasket really quick. Just trying to get a, quite a bit of balloons in this just so you can kind of see. But these are just balloons, right? I'm not giving this any annotation call out. So I'll go through here and I'll maybe I'll add some leader text. So maybe where you're going to and where you're going from. So we'll say to. ISO 1112 as an example. I'll go from ISO 111. It's another example right there. Um, maybe you need to call it your drain. So I'll give myself an annotation here, drain valve. Right here, I'll give that too, Jeff. Yep. Um, I got a ping from Grayston to let you know to bring up the bolting as well um, because it's different in the sense that it uses like virtual parts. Um, that, well. that is, that's a great point. And I don't even have bolting on here. So even bolting, right? That's a, a, a great example that I should mention as well. In this particular run here, I don't think I have any bolt, I have any bolting in this run itself. Um, what you'll end up finding is if you're ut utilizing virtual bolts, because again, if you add in the actual bolt design into this, um, it's going to take a lot of load into your overall inventor model. Um, so where if you could use a virtual bolt, you could then add the quantities of those. And then as kind of how we're bubbling here, you could kind of see if you did have a virtual bolt inside of this parts list, because I bubble to this, this strainer here, I can then add a, and attach a balloon from my list and attach any bolt that I may have. So in this case, I don't have a virtual bolt here, but if, if this was my virtual bolt, I could find it, add it to my list and make sure that you have this fully accounted for, right? Um, you could kind of see though this, as, as I'm starting to populate these balloons and adding all this information, this is gonna get pretty kind of demanding in terms of the drawing and overall visualization of it. Where if I were to submit this to my shop, my shop's probably gonna come back and tell me, why didn't I split this portion of this ISO up into different segments to make it a little bit easier um, to produce? Where this drawing itself is probably taken to fully configure, it's probably taken me about we'll say 
15, 20 minutes to fully create this drawing. Or if I were to beforehand think about how I could split this up, I could have split this ISO up into from this control valve here down to this gate valve as one ISO. I could have had my overall length on there and then uh, my simple balloons for those. And then I could have split this ISO up down here as a different segment. Okay. This could have been possibly three different ISOs. And then creating three different ISOs would have taken me, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes compared to 20, 25 minutes just for this one ISO. And then it would have been a lot cleaner to submit these into much smaller isometric packages to my shop. And they would have got the full understanding how to generate that ISO and create it and fabricate it. Okay. So hopefully, hopefully you could kind of see, I would really recommend, uh, you know, understanding what your shop's capabilities are, really what they are gonna be needing in terms of their drawing aspects, um, in terms of information that you're giving them, um, how your parts list can be set up Again, this parts list, you know, I have the item, the quantity, part numbering description. Maybe your shop doesn't care about part numbering. You could you could change your, your isometric template to not include part numbering if that's what you want. Maybe you just want item, the quantity of items and the, an overall description of any particular item that you are generating a balloon from. Okay. Again, if you're trying to call everything out though, within your ballooning like this as an example, um, you're not going to see every item. So I know sandwiched between this flange and the valve, there's a gasket there. I'm not seeing that. I won't be able to balloon that. See, I won't ever be able to actually capture the gasket here. And again, as kind of Grayson mentioned, um, if you want to add those, you're just going to have to attach them from your, your parts list. Okay, add that balloon. Now, I did see that um, Luis is asking, um, what about isogen output? Okay. Now, isogen output becomes very powerful, especially inside of Inventor. I myself, at my, at my previous company, I use isogen output in a, a, a numerous different ways. Isogen output uh, will allow you to share pretty much your overall initial design from Inventor. And then you could bring that output in as a PCF file into additional platforms or softwares. Now, an example of this is I used to have a, a process engineer that would have to check, do a stress analysis on my designs, whether um, understanding, you know, the services and fluids that are going through my designs, um, if there is, if they're going to be needing a requirement for a, maybe a bend in my design, I maybe they made it, I may need to create like some sort of loop. That way I'm not creating so much stress between my design. Um, that process engineer could utilize my PCF and bring it into their direct software, such as Caesar was one an example of that, where Caesar would then be able to leverage that PCF file, be brought into the Caesar application, and then run a process analysis, or even ANSYS as an example. Um, you could definitely do that with. But in this case, you you kind of saw that this you kind of saw the process of creating these ISO drawings, right? Now you can gain a little bit of an efficiency or you can, I want to say a little bit, you'll gain a lot of efficiency leveraging your isogen PCS and have these be brought into plant 3D. So I'll show you that now. And I'll do this for a couple ISOs. So I'll, I'll just, uh, we'll just go with, we'll say uh, maybe this pipe run zero one here. This one looks pretty generic. Uh, it has my start and end right there. So inside this run here, I can go into this isogen output here. Okay. Now I have this isogen output. It's our, it's automatically picking up that it is a pipe run zero one. It is a PCF file, and you can see that it's going to be saving it as an isogen file. I'm going to tell this where I want to save it. I'll just save it on my desktop somewhere. I think I already have some in here. I'll just save over it. I'll replace that. I just exported that one. I'll go back and I'll I'll do a couple other ones. So I'll go with seven. I'll do another isogen output. Save it to my desktop and I'll click okay. Finish that. And we'll do one more. I'll go to this route eight too. Isogen output. 
save. Okay. So now I can share these PCFs. So if you, if you need to share them with any process engineers, if you're doing any stress analysis, you can, and these could be imported into that particular software. But in this case, because I'm, I've, I'm understanding, and I found this at my, at my previous employer that we, we were constantly battling submittals and deadlines. And the amount of time and ISOs that we had inside of projects, we had sometimes up to 250 ISOs inside of some of the compressor packages that we're creating. Creating a drawing for all these takes quite a bit of time, or you need a dedicated drafting team to create your IDWs, right? Again, this is just a standard IDW type of practice inside of drawing. That takes a quite a bit of time and you could kind of see cross checking everything, um, doing all your annotations and dimensions is going to, you know, slow you down a little bit. Where in this case, because I've already done my design upfront inside of a vendor and exported these PCF files out, I'm going to leverage a tool called Plant 3D. And inside of Plant 3D, uh, there's something pretty unique about Plant that you can do. And we can use these PCF files instantly inside of the software. So I have a project open already. I'm inside of my, this piping drawing and I'll go into add and I'll find that PCF file. And I'm, I'm gonna show you two examples of this. So I'm gonna do a first example where I could make uh, convert this PCF to a drawing automatically. And I'll find this very first one here, this run zero one, click okay. And then I'm gonna, I do have a particular style setup. So I'll go with my final ANSI B here and I'll click create. And I'll let it create this and it's gonna automatically generate this isometric drawing. And you'll see this shortly. It's already processed it, it's created it. I'll select this now. And you could kind of see that instantaneously it generated an isometric for me. It's captured my fill material. It's captured cut pieces and lists for my pipe segments. Type of ends that I have for this as well as a unique template or drawing title block that you may have. Now, within here, I have all that relative information as well, such as my overall lengths, uh, dimensions to and start my endpoints, dimensioning to flanging that I have. Yeah. So I was able to just generate this drawing in a matter of seconds. I could go back into PCF again, and I'll do another example of this. We'll, we'll pick up, we'll pick a different ISO than that. Uh, we'll go with, let's run seven here. Click okay. And then I'll click create. Now let's wait for this one to create and it said it's been successful. And then as soon as I click it, it's already picking up, uh, it's already dimensioning, it's ballooning everything in terms of my bill material here. I see my bill material fully populated as well. It's all automatically picking up your nominal diameter, which is two inch in this case, your quantities, and then this descriptions. And again, this is all coming directly from Inventor. Okay, so I didn't really tailor too much inside of Plant 3D. There is quite a bit of, legwork to do um, inside of your own uh, plant environment if you choose to use this and go this route, but you can. You can create your PCFs and automatically generate these isometric drawings, okay? So you can kind of see just creating these two alone, how fast I was able to throw out a output of an isometric drawing. Where lastly, all I would have to do is then print this out and, and give it to my boss or give it to a senior designer that's gonna be checking your designs and then give you the okay for you to uh, submit it to your shop. One other way you can go about this. So what it first showed was, you know, going from a PCF directly to an ISO. What I can do also is use those PCFs. And if I go into this home view here, I can go PCF to pipe. And I could actually select all these PCFs, click open, create this piping directly inside of Plant 3D as well. And you can see that this piping is gonna automatically get generated inside of Plant. So it's 100% complete, I'll click close. And I'm just gonna zoom out just so you can kind of see. But it's automatically brought in and converted those PCFs to relative Plant 3D data, 
which is iso this isometric right here. Okay. And what you're probably noticing right away, just because I'm gonna want I'm gonna want to let everyone know this is the difference in coordinate systems. So if you do want to go about this way here and actually convert your PCS inside a plant and create the actual 3D piping from it, you're gonna want to understand that AutoCAD Plant 3D uses a different coordinate system than what Inventor does. That's why um, this, this piping here looks a little bit tweaked. It's not in the same orientation as my Inventor model. So you, you'll see that this X, Y, and Z, the Z is going at, um, at a vertical direction here. Or if I go back into Inventor, let's compare the differences. So the Z is actually going um, to the left over here, where my Y is going vertical. If you want these to really align up together, um, I would definitely recommend if you want to do this process that you generate and create your models so that the coordinate system in Inventor, so I'm just going to kind of align this, matches the coordinate system of Plant 3D. So now, now I can see that my Z is going in the same direction as my Z inside of Plant. Okay, So that way when you then create your drawings or, or create your models inside of an inventor. Sorry, let me go back over here. So then when you create your models inside of inventor with this same UCS system, um, it's gonna come into plan as you expect it to visually see. It just will take you to generate any, any parts, any assemblies that you're creating with that same exact coordinate system. Okay. Now again, with, with the piping being uh, created inside of plant, what I can do here is use that same uh, tool set for creating my ISO. So I could create a production ISO. What I'll see here is the line number now, now that I imported those PCFs. I could select a specific line number, which in this case, I'll go with my run nine. I'll create the ISO. And that's because I have these all within my, my plan environment now and generate this isometric. So I'll wait for this to populate. I'm gonna get a little, dialog box letting me know that this ISO has been created. Go view and then I'll click the isometrics to view it. And there we go. There's the ISO. And you can see it has my overall dimensions. It has my uh, callouts, open ends, and all the relative information from the BOM as well. Okay. Um, I I did see a question. Is there any limitations with iLogic or Inventor API to utilize some sort of drawing automation with tube and pipe? I don't believe so. Again, um, the the drawing aspects of Inventor is going to be the same as any other assembly or any other drawing that you're creating. So you should have the same iLogic uh, functionality for um, for streamlining some of these processes for you. Jose, hopefully that answered your question. Any questions so far on, on uh, bringing these PCS into plant and then being able to create your isometrics pretty rapidly going about that way? What method would you recommend for you for calculating pipe route capacity? What do you mean by pipe route capacity, Mike Jones? Not sure exactly mm -hmm. what you mean. I had to do it. I had to do it. What was that? Nothing. Uh, Luis, can you can you fix the orientation and AutoCAD change to the Z? Uh, I would not recommend doing that. I would recommend keeping AutoCAD or Plant 3D really your your main um, orientation, but changing the orientation inside of your Inventor model itself. That'd be the best bet. Now, Plant does have its own configuration. I will talk about that shortly um, in case this is a method that you want to do. But within the inventor, really, it's it's the overall process of creating drawings. I know we got quite a bit of questions from that on the last presentation. It is about the same as creating any other drawing. Um, again, I I would just really think about this from a kind of like a high level perspective and understand when your design is kind of becoming a little over complex versus you know a simplistic route that you can create that you can easily um, you know throw out a a drawing from it. Uh, Mike Jones, for a water system, how much water is the whole pipe route in liters or gallons? Uh, Mike, for that, you would probably want to open up the, the pipe run itself 
Uh, I don't think it's going to be able to show you that, but within the pipe run, if you go into the I properties here, and then you go into the physical, you do have some some properties here where you could get like volume, um, your mass, your area. You will, you probably will have to do some calculations for that to understand that. Okay. So I'll go back into my PowerPoint really quick. Um. We do have some poll questions. I'm going to want to throw up our poll questions. How does this help users of AutoPipe who use a program to do pipe stress analysis? Uh, so how, how does this help users of AutoPipe who use a program to do pipe stress analysis? So for pipe stress analysis, um, you do, for PCF files, I think that becomes very beneficial, bringing these into pipe stress analysis. It's going to be kind of hard to capture. There is a multiple different pipe stress analysis software out there. I'm not sure what you're using exactly, your mo, is that you pronounce it? Um, but it will help with overall uh, design aspects and design reviews, whether you need to review, you know, stress within a particular band, um, stress within if you have adequate loops for your piping, um, I know I've ran into that myself a lot with um, previously at my other company where, you know, I just did, I had too much straight length where I had a, a particular service going through a route that my entire design needed to be changed because I didn't account for the amount of pressure or force going through that pipe. Okay, so as um, I do, we do have some poll questions coming up. Um, with the poll questions, I do want to kind of mention um, some of the projects that I've been working on lately, just so everyone's kind of aware. Uh, but I recently did a plant 3D environment creation. So if you saw plant, if you saw the plant side of it, plant's pretty unique. It, um, plant does have uh, the PNAD aspect of it. So I ended up de developing a customer's uh, unique symbology for them. Um, that way they could use their own symbols inside their PNAD documentation. And then I mapped all those symbols inside the project so that they can be leveraged and then have a, a, a direct reflection with the plant 3D model. And then from there, we, I developed the, pipe, the plant 3D pipe specifications. Um, these specifications were directly dictated by the customer. Again, so I, I met their standards and needs where I built a pipe specification library for their needs, as well as generating a unique reporting for them. So that way, when you're when you're creating your models, or whether they're in PNAD or in plant, um, you're able to get unique reporting features, such as maybe understanding how many valves you may have inside of an assembly without having to count everything from your PNAD document is, is pretty unique, or getting cut lengths for your welds. Um, I, I generated some unique reporting for that. Uh, most recently, I worked on a PNAD project, a migration project as well, where I took a old PNAD project that had over to 200 to 300 drawings um, that was in an older version. Um, I set it up to utilize with BIM 360 internally, where we had uh, internal Kativ uh, members collaborate together, where we could all work on this one project at the same time, upgrading it because of differences with how plant was configured in the 2016 version to meet the current standards of what is in 2021. And again, um, if, you, if you see that, if you notice right away between the different isometric drawings between plant and, and inventor is inventor's isos look a lot prettier, right? You, you get this uh, parametric view, you get bubbling, you, you're understanding what you're calling out versus inside of plant, it's more of just a 2D line representations, but it is pulling the same characteristics, the same overall dimensions. You're ballooning, you're getting your BOMs. Um, I know when we first implemented Plan at my previous company, it did take our shop quite a bit to understand um, visually because they were so used to getting these isometric drawings that were visually appealing, right? It gave them all the information up front versus now I'm giving them these 2D drawings. It was, it was quite hard for them to really grasp and take and make sure that they got all the information out of their drawings so, in order for them to be able to fabricate. So it is a bit of a change. Um, but then again, you get you get the efficiency bump from it, though. So you're able to generate all these ISOs within you know minutes versus spending time creating a, a ISO at a time inside of Inventor and then cross checking everything. There is still going to be checking aspects to it, but you could kind of see how much uh, 
more time demanding that the inventor route will take. Okay. Um, Nigel, I believe we wanted to mention our accelerate and innovation. Yeah, Jeff. Um, so we have this event that's happening, and I, I think Jessica is going to go ahead and post the um, go ahead and post the link in the respective chats of both streams right now. But we're doing this uh, accelerate innovation with digital transformation uh, webinar as well on March sixteenth at eleven a.m. Pacific, um, and that's mainly about uh, fusion life cycle, so PLM. Um, so if you are interested in that, Jessica just posted the. Uh, the post just posted the link inside of the uh, inside of the chat. So go ahead and just join through there, and uh, they'll go through those. And then uh, you want to just jump into questions, Jeff? Yep. Hold on. Let me uh, go into the next one. Question and yep. answers. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. So I see one that's like when using AutoCAD Plant 3D and PNID, is it possible to transfer routing from there into either Plant 3D and or Inventor? So when changing a item or a line within the PNID software, have it affect like the inventor side. So have it, I guess, um, tied to the inventor models. Not in inventor directly, but you do get it inside of plant. That's uh, one of the key benefits of plant is it's, it's native associativity with PNID. So as a PNID document's being changed and updated inside of the plant 3D software, um, if you're routing directly off the PNID, you'll understand, you know, what components are inside of, say, Route 101. You'll be able to understand that that route has a valve, a gate valve, a ball valve, and then it has maybe a drain valve. Um, when you're creating your 3D parametric model inside of plant, you could place directly from that particular line as a line list so that you could ensure you're utilizing all the proper components, uh, making sure you're not missing anything, but it also will capture uh, unique values such as tag information as well. So you're, you're reducing time tagging as well. So if the PNED is dictating tagging sequences for your valves or any components, even the line line numbering, um, you could bring that over directly into the plant model as well. Uh, but it does PNED. So again, the PNED is not going to have any direct correlation to inventor again it, it like i i did in the past is i would have to print out my pnad document and then go through what my very first route is and highlight and making sure that i captured everything inside of my inventor model making sure i have all my proper events or any other takeoffs or tie-ins and then have that all correctly labeled inside of the isometric drawing when i when i want to take that 3d aspect into the 2d idw environment Cool. I think that's just about everything that we have for questions. You see any other ones, Jeff, that came through? I'm looking really quick. Da, 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 da. Can you fix orientation? I think I got that. How does help users got that? I switched the name. I think I got it all. Yep. All right. There's one more. Thank you. Lastly, the piping and tubing, tube routing available in Inventor 21 only on earlier packages. Piping, tubing, pipe routing. Um, so tube and pipe is only available in Inventor Professional. Um, you won't get that in Base Inventor or even Inventor LT. Um, I think but most people now have Inventor Pro though. So Pro, like odds yeah. are, if you have AutoCAD and Inventor, like if you have both, um, odds are you have full-blown Inventor Professional. I You can't buy regular Inventor anymore by itself. So um, just if you've been like grandfathered in and staying on maintenance for like Base Inventor would be the only reason you don't have Inventor Pro. Yeah. Um, so just keep that in mind. And inventor, inventor tube of pipes been around for quite a bit. Yeah, um, like so at I'm, least at least five or six years, if not more. I think even before the 2015 version. Um, I think that's the last one I remember. So it should have it. And then I would definitely recommend uh, Ufirmo to take a look at the previous. And uh, we were trying to really kind of make this like a, like a. Uh, a little series, mini series for tube and pipe. So my other colleague, Adam, did the very first video. I, I went from that into advanced workflows and into the drawing just because of the amount of questions we got for showing some drawings on there. Um, I also touched, I did mention, I do want to mention, I did make a blog post for 
how to create your own naming scheme as well. I'll definitely take a look at that blog post that has some further information so you can understand how to create your own naming scheme. Um, that way you could quickly identify whether what route it is, what information is a part of that route. Okay, I think that's, that's all I had. Uh, one last thing is, Nigel, can you still host AVAs on Thursdays? <laughs> Wow, trash. Um, no, actually, today's my last day here at Khatib. So i uh, just like to thank everybody for joining us um, over the last couple of years. Doesn't mean that AFA is going to be over. It just means that my time here um, is coming to a close. So uh, you'll see people like Jeff or Adam or any of the other people here at Khatib join these webinars. I know they have a lot in store for you all. So uh, definitely stay excited. Um, I'll probably I'll go ahead and subscribe with my own personal. You'll probably see me in like the chat every once in a while. I've got time early on Thursdays. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you all. Uh, for those of you who I've worked with, like from you know support all the way to these webinars, all the way to things like pre-sales and even customer success, uh, definitely a pleasure to work with you all and everyone here at the Kativ organization. So I just like to uh, you know iterate my thanks to everybody. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Irmo, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate all the questions. Again. Um, if there's anything else that comes up, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be able to address those questions for you. Yeah.